Welcome to Alive and Thriving. My name is Jessica. I am so happy to have you here today. I have a very special guest joining us on today's podcast. Her name is Serena Coventry, and I have linked all of her details because you are going to want to follow her. She is just the most warm and caring and beautiful soul. So Serena is a women's health nutritionist and nutritionist, sorry, and clinical EFT practitioner. Her mission is to empower women so that they can transfer their relationship with their body, their reproductive health, and maintain a regulated nervous system. Serena supports women to balance their hormones, to process trauma and negative beliefs related to themselves or the world around them. She's passionate about teaching women to work with their body rather than against their body, which I know so many of us, even myself included, can relate to. And this is so that they can holistically restore a state of well-being and thrive. So we are going to get into today's episode and I just want to start and I say this as well when we start speaking, but Serena and I would love to hear from you. Come over and tell us what you have taken away from this experience, from this episode today. If there was any aha moments or anything that you really are going to go and implement a change that you're going to make or something that you'd like to explore or just ask Serena some questions. We love to hear from you and I just can't wait for you to meet her. Oh, she's so beautiful. So let's get into today's episode and I will see you on the other side of the introduction. You're listening to Alive and Thriving with Jessica Reed, the podcast that's all about empowering you to achieve optimal wellness and success through self-care, holistic practices, and raw conversations. Jessica and her expert guests are here to share powerful insights and strategies to help you overcome stress and anxiety, take charge of your life, and thrive in life and in business. Grab a cuppa and let's dive in. Welcome, Serena, to Alive and Thriving. I have to say again, I feel like I have to share with our listeners. This is actually take two because Serena graced me with her beautiful energy a couple of weeks ago and my microphone just had this, I don't know what, I think a little gremlin crawled inside and just made it like echo and repeat everything that I said. It wasn't even an echo. It was like repetition over the top of me speaking and then there was this awkward delay and then poor Serena was in the, like sitting there like waiting to speak. And so it wasn't, it was not editable. And so she has graciously (laughs) agreed to come back for what we believe is going to be an even more epic conversation today on amazing topics like EFT for women's health, cyclical nutrition, living within your cycle, like cyclical living, which I just can't wait to talk about. So welcome. Thank you. It's so great to be back. (laughs) I know that last time we chatted about so many amazing things, so I have no doubt we'll continue to chat about more amazing things again today. And thanks so much for having me on. It feels like an absolute honor to be in your presence and your energy, and you've created such an amazing space for women to receive a lot of support. So thank you for having me. Oh, no, it's so lovely to have you here. You are just such a beautiful person. And and if you don't follow Serena on Instagram, go and follow her because there is just this real safety and this real like warmth around even just following Serena on Instagram. So yeah, jump over and do that. I'm going to link Serena's Instagram. I'm going to link how you can work with her. I'm going to link her resources, all the things in these show notes. But even if you just pop over and say, hi, I listened to you on Alive and Thriving and I had this aha moment or I didn't realize this or this thing that you talked about, I've experienced just, we love that. We love that because Serena is as impact driven as you and I. And as we speak about on so many episodes, so just keep drilling this in to know that we are making an impact 
we need to be told, right? Like we don't know. I had such a beautiful message from one of my masterminders the other day and she's, I know I would not be where I am right now if I was not in this group and if I didn't have you. And she said, I just needed to tell you in case you didn't know. And my response was, I genuinely didn't know. And it's the same if you listen to a podcast, if you, you know, go and tell Serena what you got out of today. Come and tell me what you got out of today. We want to know how this has impacted you. Yeah, I find that in the social media world, you put something out there or you write a blog or you do a podcast and it goes out into the abyss and you're like, did anyone listen? Did anyone (laughs) care? Does anyone have any feedback, positive or negative? Let me know. Have I changed a life today? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Tell me, I need the reassurance, please. <laughs> exactly. No, it's it is. It's so good to know because then we have this extra motivation to know that to continue to create and to continue to do and to continue to put all of these amazing free resources and things out into the world so that you can benefit. But yeah, come and tell us. Come and say hi, Serena. I have formally introduced you before we started recording. I wonder if you would be happy though to go a little bit more in depth for us. Can you share a little bit more about who you are? And uh, you know what? I'm going to throw out the challenge. Someone put me on the spot and did this. We didn't do this last time. Serena, Serena's shitting herself now. <laughs> What's going to happen? <laughs> Can you describe yourself, first of all, for us without your profession? Who are you? And yeah. then how did you get into what you're doing? Yes. I would like to describe myself honestly as a warm hug. And Ooh. I know from You didn't even have to think about it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I paused I... ten minutes and someone asked me, I said, come back. <laughs> I strive really hard to, whether it's in my personal or my professional life, I strive really hard to be a safe place for people, whether that's friends or like I said, my clients. So the feedback I've had from clients and friends is that when they're in my presence, they feel really grounded. Mm -hmm. They feel really calm. They feel really nurtured. I like to think that within my, my personal relationships, I have this like really strong mama energy. I've got you. I want to look after you, which I've definitely had to learn boundaries around a lot of boundaries around that because I used to be way too much of a giver and I would put other people's needs in front of mine But I do bring that into my clients' experience too, where I want them to feel like I've got them. And as we'll get into, a lot of the women I work with are having a lot of hormonal issues. They don't trust their body. They don't know what's happening for them. They've been through trauma or they feel really dissociated from themselves. And I think that having a practitioner in front of you who is able to hold that space for you, who is able to feel grounded, gives you the safety that you can go into whatever you are experiencing, knowing that they've got you. No, oh, I just feel so safe and held even in this space right now. There is, as I, as I said before, even just following you on Instagram and even in the conversations that we've had before together outside of this, you do have this beautiful warmth and I can reflect that back to you. That is something that is very naturally emanating out of you. And I love that. And I imagine that, as you said, that allows your clients to be able to go deeper faster because their body actually feels safe enough to start exploring what they need to because you've taken the first step in creating this beautiful warm space and this safe space yeah. for them to be able to do that. Thank so you. <laughs> you, how did you get into, you have a beautiful blend of modalities. So you EFT, mm-hmm. cyclical nutrition, yeah, and then cyclical living. Yeah. And for someone listening, they absolutely do all go together, which you're going to hear today. But how did you get into particularly those three specialties? Because they're so beautiful and they're so unique when they're blended together. Yeah, I said this last time and I want to say it again. I find that a lot of practitioners that I talk to or that I've worked alongside, when you're a bit of a left of field practitioner or you enter the natural health space or the holistic health space, I often find that people get there because of their own personal journey, whether Mm -hmm. it's been maybe not even their personal journey, but they've seen someone close to them go through something and they've wanted to know how to support them deeper. That turning pain into purpose. Yeah, absolutely. And that often makes the best practitioner because they know exactly where you once stood and they know how you felt and they deeply know how to support you because they've most often than not had to support themselves through that. So I 
initially started studying psychology when I was probably 19. I loved psychology. I'm fascinated with humans. I actually had a Vedic astrology reading the other day and she was telling me in my chart how it shows how much I just want to understand the way the world works and understand the way people work in our brain. Mm. So of course I started with psychology (laughs) and as I got more and more through psychology, I had an unexpected pregnancy and this might be a little bit of a a trigger warning for anyone listening, but when I was 20, 21, I had this unexpected pregnancy and I just knew that it wasn't my time to become a mother. I know that I'm destined to become a mother, but I was just too young. I wasn't in a relationship that I felt would thrive forever. I had so many things I wanted to do and experiences I wanted to learn. I know that When I do have a child, I want to be able to give them the most resources. So I know that I need to be the most resourced. So I underwent a pregnancy termination, which within that was just so many different feels from grief to shame, a lot of questioning myself. How did I let this happen? A lot of personal blame. And I just shut down from that moment. And I didn't really know that I had shut down. But when I look back on it, I'm like, you just completely cut off from the neck down. I decided I didn't want to do psychology anymore. I ended that relationship. I had the complete life overhaul and I met up with a friend. I'm big on signs. And if we talk about anything manifesting, I'm huge on all of that and putting the energy you want to receive out into the world. And she started talking about nutrition and that she was going to study it. And I had always wanted to study nutrition, but I had been told from older people in my life that's not a viable career you're never going to make enough money that's really hard and being this young 18 19 year old girl choosing what uni degree she was going to do I was like veto the nutrition Mm. but when I was sitting in front of that friend I was so hopeless about everything in life I was like I just don't know what I want to do I was like this is a sign (laughs) so I went to the Endeavor College of Natural Health open day And on that open day, there were three different lecturers that all told me that I looked really familiar and I had never seen any of these people before. So again, I was like, wow, maybe I'm meant to be here. I'm just meant to be here. And when I was in that, when I was at that uni, I felt so expanded. I felt so much bigger. Mm. I felt at home. It felt like a beautiful, safe space. And I was like, this is what I need to do. So I started studying nutrition. I had zero interest in women's health. I was very into how food impacts your mood and your energy. Mm-hmm. Again, with nutrition with a psychological lens. Yep. And I was diagnosed with, I had all these issues happening with my menstrual cycle. I was exhausted. I had acne. I started gaining weight that I couldn't shift. And I was always a very healthy eater. I moved a lot. And I was like, what's happening here? So when I got testing done, turns out that I had PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome. And I just immediately shame spiraled. I was like, this is why I have PCOS. It's because I had a termination. Like I've brought this upon myself again, so much Mm self-blame. And I was like, the universe is punishing me. All of these just really intense emotions and feelings started coming up for me. And again, I just pushed them aside. I kept on being this busy girl. I was studying nutrition. So I started adopting all of the principles that I knew that were out there in the research to support PCOS. I had tried keto diet, which is basically no carbs. I had tried Mm -hmm. paleo. I think I even went vegetarian or vegan at one point. I was counting my calories, which I despise (laughs) counting calories. I was training like six or seven days a week and I was exhausted I was just burning the candle at every end and none of my Mm. symptoms were getting better gosh I can imagine what kind of stress response your body must have been in during yeah Yeah. now it's funny because now that I have the knowledge that I have about the body Mm. and hormones and holistic health and all of that I'm like what were you doing (laughs) (laughs) what were you doing you're doing what everybody else thought was normal yeah yeah Yeah. And so I started researching more and I came across a book called In the Flow by Mm -hmm. Alyssa Vitti. And I say this on every podcast that I've ever done and every workshop that if I ever see that woman, I will single-handedly thank her for my career. 
because her book talks all about cyclical living and how your hormones are ebbing and flowing and changing across the month, which actually impacts your needs on a biochemical level, on a metabolism level, on a microbiome Mm -hmm. level, energetically, nutritionally, all these things. And I just remember reading this book and every single page, I was like, oh my God, like, how did I not know this? So I adopted cyclical living, which completely changed my energy and my physical health and my symptoms of PCOS started clearing up. I was losing weight. My acne was clearing. I was just feeling a lot more in tune and alive with my body. Mm -hmm. But then another thing happened and I find that life is just a buildup of things that we try. And I have a lot of curiosity. I'm curious about everything that exists in this world. And I'm always like, why? (laughs) Some people find it immensely annoying because they're like, (laughs) settle with this. And I'm like, no, I want to know why. Yeah. So cyclical living obviously tuned me into my body that I had just completely shut down from. And Mm -hmm. when I started opening this doorway into understanding how my emotions were shifting and my energy was shifting and my nutritional needs were shifting it opened this huge doorway into parts of me that I had completely shut off from which was my emotional health and the state of my nervous system and when those doors opened they opened like floodgates (laughs) and again I felt like I had just lost touch with everything I was like wow what are all these feelings and body sensations that I've never felt before yeah and my mom who's also a very curious human being and has studied everything holistic health under the sun she started talking to me about EFT tapping and she was going through the training process herself at that point and I remember looking at it and I thought this is weird what are people tapping on these weird (laughs) I thought that too I was like oh but I was so desperate I'll try anything I remember thinking yeah "Yeah, I'm so desperate I'll try it it's weird that's fine but How good is it doing the weird stuff? (laughs) Yeah. I remember I immediately just enrolled into a four-day workshop with Mm -hmm. one of who I think is one of the most amazing trainers in Australia, Naomi Jansen. And I was, again, I was mind blown. And I was like, how have I not known about this tool? And within that, within that course, I signed up for the course, obviously. I was like, I need to, I was doing it myself and I was doing it with other practitioners and I thought mm. oh, this is really just healing me from the inside out. Yeah. And obviously signed up to become a practitioner. And within that, you have to do a lot of personal work mm. and doing that personal work stuff that I didn't even know was there from childhood and my teens and a lot was coming up around that pregnancy termination and just cutting myself off from my body. Mm. And that kind of paired with the cyclical living, understand how my actual body was working. And then with the EFT, understanding my nervous system and my emotional health, yeah, it just created this rounded full picture for how I can support a woman. And mm. now when I think back to working with clients without the EFT, I just think, how did I do it? Because there's only so far and so much you can do with someone by saying, okay, go and change your diet in this way or Mm. go and change your lifestyle in this way. Whereas if their beliefs and their emotions and their nervous system is programmed as no, that's too hard or we're in too much of a stress response, we can't calm down. Then no matter what you do on a nutritional level, you're only going to be scratching the surface. Mm, I love that because I was going to ask you, obviously, there's so many things that we can use EFT for. And so I was going to ask you on what layers it filters into the work that you do with nutrition. Because again, like we're saying at the beginning, some people might hear those things and think, oh, these are so that they're not intertwined. They're not one whole big picture. But as you're so beautifully explaining They are. And so you're using EFT, I'm hearing, to not only just address, say, the resistance to someone changing their eating habits, but you're using it to make sure that their nervous system is calm and regulated so they can actually operate from a space of rest and digest. And so their body can actually process their hormones properly. And so they all the things that I'm sure you can explain so much better than me. But and then from that emotional trauma level as well, including that kind of healing in hormone health and in nutrition, gosh, that's game-changing. 
That really yeah. truly is because the more yeah. your body holds on to, as you said, that everything else you're doing is just surface work. Mm -hmm. It's surface work until you can actually clear and hold that internal space to be for that surface work to actually land and for you to embody that that person that you are trying to be who eats the way that your body needs you to eat or who eats in a way that supports your hormones which I also want to talk yeah. about as yeah. well so yeah, how else so am I right is that how yeah. you all the layers of EFT absolutely, absolutely. and there there are so many layers but mm -hmm. with in terms of your hormones and your menstrual cycle and your reproductive health, one of the biggest thing that's going to impact that is your level of body safety. Mm. And if your body feels like it's in this chronic stress response, you're going to be chronically inflamed. You're going to be, you're, when you're stressed and you're in, so there's two different branches of the nervous system. You have the sympathetic, which is like your stress state. Mm -hmm. You have the parasympathetic, which is your calm, your rest and digest. When you are in that stress state, it is impacting all of your major organs, including mm -hmm. your digestive system and your production of stomach acid, which we mm -hmm. need to digest our foods and absorb yeah. those nutrients is influencing our reproductive system and that relationship mm. between our brain and our ovaries. Yeah. So for the clients that I was seeing who were really stressed and we were doing all of these nutritional changes to try and support their menstrual cycle, have a healthy average 28 day cycle where they were ovulating mm. each month and they weren't having this immense period pain or these immense mood shifts and feeling like the world was ending the week before their period. Mm having a nervous system tool to deeply support them with the stress or yeah. even the emotional challenges, like stress comes in so many different forms. And mm -hmm. if you are constantly suppressing emotions, that is all being stored as stress in your body. So with those women who are having reproductive issues, again, the body is going to prioritize cortisol, which is your stress hormone over your reproductive hormones, such as estrogen, yeah. progesterone. So yeah. we really need to lower that cortisol before any kind of mm. nutritional or lifestyle changes are going to impact them. I was just about to ask about the cortisol and how that impacts in terms of reproductive systems. So thank you for explaining that. Yeah. And same with, I support women on their fertility journey as well. So mm. that's a whole other topic where these mm. women may have been trying for a really long period yeah. of time to get pregnant within that comes so many emotional challenges, strains on their relationship, fear yeah. around not conceiving, grief, grief. they yeah. have conceived or they've then had a pregnancy loss. So there's so many things in there where EFT just gives this really immensely like a hug for the body where it lets mm -hmm. you know that you're safe. You can let go of past things that have happened and really support that emotional level and the nervous system level. So as you said, a lot of people don't realize how they intertwine. In, 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 <laughs> Hello, language. <laughs> it's all right. It's Monday for me today. Like it's Tuesday, but it's a Monday for me today because yeah. I don't work Mondays. And so yeah. my words are probably going to make up all sorts of things as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's the same as well with, I work a lot with women who have issues around emotional eating. Mm -hmm. And recently I've been working with a client who, every night after dinner, she just eats immense amounts of food, very specific types of food. Yeah. And if I was working with her purely on nutrition of, all right, we'll just eat more of these foods in the day. It's going to stop you from eating in the evening. She has all these emotional ties to food being used as an emotional soother by yeah. her parents her whole life. Yeah. So I feel like, yeah, it's just, it's such an incredible tool for almost nutrition is like a how do I explain it as like a metaphor nutrition is part of it mm. but the basis like allowing your body to work and do the things it's meant to do all lies yeah. in the health of your nervous system yeah oh amazing I love that yeah EFT is just so powerful isn't it and I've been able to witness as well myself changes of people with emotional eating and being able to empower themselves to not only do that deeper work with you as a practitioner to to go deeper and release those deep associations 
but then to know that they have a tool as well that, that they can self-apply at home if they are in those moments where it's I need to turn to the sugar, I need to turn to the chips, I need to turn to the wine, it, it, whatever it is that that they are using or all the things in some people's cases or whatever it is. So I love that that you bring in this beautiful holistic picture and I really hope that for anybody listening particularly if you maybe brought up in generations like me where it was like very much diet culture and when we were taught about nutrition we were only really taught about that food pyramid which I don't eat half the things on that food pyramid now like half of those things actually interact with my body quite badly but that's what we were taught about nutrition and what we were taught about nutrition actually went hand in hand with dieting in in the way that I was brought up and with body shaming issues and all of these things. And so what I really hope is that as you are listening, if you are on a journey where perhaps you know that your diet is not supportive of how you want to be feeling and it's not supportive of a healthy, energetic body, that this isn't actually like what Serena is talking about is not a diet. It is not even just lifestyle changes. It is actually a big holistic picture of how can you heal on all levels within your body so that you can then support your day-to-day functioning and your essential organ functioning with the right nutrition. But you've, you've got to clear out that emotion and that stress for optimal functioning. And then tying that into your cyclical living, which is what I'd love to talk about yeah. a little bit more now. Can you tell me what is the difference between, for lack of a better word, dieting because everyone's so familiar with it, like a regular diet, going on a regular kind of diet, maybe say keto, paleo, vegan, whatever whatever it is for you, carnivore. What is yeah. the difference between choosing a diet and eating for your cyclical health? Yeah. But I will say, first and foremost, eating for your cyclical health does not feel in any way restrictive. Mm. It's moving with the ebbs and flow of what your body needs. And so many, just as a bit of a baseline, so many of these diets have actually come about from research that's been done on men, especially Mm. keto and paleo. Most of the research has been done on men and men and women's bodies are dramatically different. And we're only starting to learn about how different our needs really are. And within that book, In the Flow, she talks about two kind of rhythms and men and women have different rhythms. So women have something called an infradian rhythm, which is, this is an average 28 day cycle. Not every woman's going to have a 28 day cycle, but this infradian rhythm kind of looks at how our shifting hormones so we often have estrogen highest in the first half of our cycle and progesterone highest in the second half of our cycle these are actually influencing our brain chemistry our metabolism our microbiome our energy our motivation our stress response and obviously our fertility Mm. so our need especially if our metabolism and microbiome are shifting across the month then our needs are going to change across the month yeah. Whereas when we look at a man, he is operating on a 24-hour testosterone cycle. So when he wakes up every day, he's going to have a similar experience. When he goes to bed every single day, he's going to have a similar experience. Mm. Whereas for women, that is shifting across the 28 days. So when I think about the typical diets that are out there, where women are told to potentially just calorie restrict or to eat a keto diet across the whole month, it's actually not going to be supportive for your body. In -hmm. terms of calorie restriction, and I've seen this time and time again, ironically, I actually used to work for a company as a nutrition coach that was based on calorie restriction. And everyone that I told that I worked there, they were like, why are you working there? (laughs) But it was really great insight to see how much women's cycles do influence their needs. So Mm. in the first half of your cycle, you might not be as hungry. You don't necessarily need as much food purely because your body just has this desire to try and get you pregnant. So that's the window between when your period ends and up until ovulation. So you have a lot more energy, you have a lot more capacity, and oftentimes you may not need as many calories. 
Whereas, or as much energy, I prefer to say, not calories. Mm. Whereas when we have ovulated and then we're moving towards our menstrual phase, the body actually requires two to 300 more calories each Mm. day because the body might think that you're pregnant. So it's going to be needing all these extra nutrients to try and feed that little fetus, feed your body, your metabolism slows down. For a woman that is put on a calorie restricted diet all month long, she's setting herself up for failure because her body is actually going to need more energy in that second half of the month. Mm -hmm. And if she's not consuming more of that energy, then her body will turn on these kind of very biological desires of being like, you need more food. So it will ramp up her hunger. It will ramp up her cravings for sweet, salty, sugary. Mm, I was going to say, does that actually impact then cravings and people think, oh, I can't like, oh, yeah, I'm really craving these foods at this point in time, but really actually your body just wants you to be consuming more yeah. whole food calories. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And the same goes for a lot of the other diets. So like in terms of keto, there are certain parts of your menstrual cycle that might be more suited to a ketogenic diet, say mm-hmm. in that first half of your cycle mm-hmm. between your period up until ovulation. Whereas in the second half of your cycle, having those complex carbohydrates for blood sugar support and mood support is going to be so important. And yes. so I even notice with clients that I work with and in myself, if I'm not eating enough complex carbs, which is like your sweet potato or your pumpkin or your brown rice Mm. in the second half of my cycle, again, I'm like savagely hungry. So you're setting yourself up, you're setting yourself up for failure again. Mm. And then the narrative becomes, why can't I do this? Why can't I be motivated? You start putting yourself down. I can't stick to anything. This is my fault. And you just again, your self-esteem just becomes lower and lower. Yeah. And and it's not your fault. It's Mm. absolutely not your fault. You've been given a diet or an eating regime that's actually not built for you. It's not going to support you. So when you learn how to eat in a way that is going to support how your body shows up in that first half of your cycle compared to how it shows up in that second half of your cycle, it doesn't feel hard. You yeah. don't feel restricted. You don't feel hungry. You don't have cravings through the moon. You really become in tune with how your body is feeling and how you can support it and what it needs. Yeah. And I always say once you start cyclically living and especially cyclically eating, you can't undo it. Mm. And I've noticed in the first half of your cycle, sometimes people refer to the phase of your cycle as the seasons. Mm-hmm. So in that first half, when you stop bleeding and up until ovulation, that's like your spring and summer. Yeah. And when I started cyclically living, I noticed that my body was actually craving more light salad style foods, Mm. stir fries or those raw foods. Yeah. Whereas when I was coming into the later half of my cycle and my bleed, which is your almost autumn and winter. Yeah. My body was like, no, we do not want to go munch on carrot and hummus. We want you to make us a cup of bone broth and we want like a slow cook stew or something. So the body knows, like the body knows what it needs and it wants. It's just about listening to it. Yeah. And to circle back to what you were talking about with EFT, like stress will 100% block your intuition and your connection into your body. So even if that is all you use it for, just to lower stress enough so that you can actually tune in and be like, no, what do I actually need right now? And then having the discernment to be able to make the decision to be like, okay, I feel like a salad, therefore I am not going to eat this heavier food or I feel like this heavier food, therefore I'm not going to, like you said, eat the carrot sticks with hummus today because I actually want something more dense and more nourishing in that sense. To be able to really tune in and to listen to your body is, is a skill and it needs to be practiced. It's something yeah. that you don't just magically switch on, but something that every single one of you listening can 100% switch on. Yeah, and it's a, practice. Because it's a learning. I've been teaching this now for four years and there are still things that I continuously learn about myself and my menstrual mm. cycle and how I feel. And it's more of a lifestyle. And I know for some people that might sound overwhelming, but it is this beautiful unfolding of 
relearning yourself and relearning Mm. how your body works and within that you are connecting to yourself in a way that actually helps to reduce stress and when you're stressed and you're in this survival mode you're not consciously thinking oh what does my body need you're like get me the nearest goddamn food now otherwise I'm gonna die which often Mm. is something in a packet or something like I said before is high sugar or high carb which yeah cycle of spinning you out and spinning your blood sugar out and your mood and then you just yeah I was gonna say it's also got that impact of that whole like you've got that excess cortisol so then we release more insulin because cortisol is not going into your muscles to give you fight or flight energy it is just going to end up getting parked around your belly and then the then the insulin needs a job to do so then you need to eat something but then it's this vicious cycle of but then you're on the diet yeah. that's not working and you hate yourself because yeah. you can't figure out why you're not losing weight. Why you're not losing weight and why your cycle's all over the place. And one of the most common things I hear when people are stressed because we get to, they fill in their new client forms or even just when we're having conversation, like sitting, I don't know, at the hairdresser or somewhere, you're having conversation yeah. and people are like, yeah, oh, my cycle's been really off or I've missed my period this month or it's come five days late or whatever it is happening for them. And the first question that always comes to my mind is, are you stressed? What is actually going on for you? And they'll often go, oh, yeah, I've been stressed, but. But we need to stop there at that but. Like that that but is not relevant. (laughs) Let's start there then. Start there because that stress will, I know there's a lot of talk around where we blame stress for a lot of things all the research that's coming out around all the different illnesses and diseases that stress is now being linked back to the stress is a natural part of life and obviously there are some good stresses as well we all need you stress in our life but having said that long-term chronic stress can be blamed for so much including not saying this is not medical advice by any means, still get yourself checked for whatever's going on for you. But the impact that stress takes on your body when you're going into your sympathetic nervous system and we think about the basic functions of your body that are no longer happening Mm -hmm. simply because, like you said, it's we need to, we're going to die. So let's just make sure that doesn't happen today. But that means that the things that you need to function optimally day to day aren't working And if your body sits in that for a long period of time, then there's so many different aspects of your health, including your hormonal and your reproductive health. And if you're sitting there and you're like, well, I haven't been stressed for the last couple of weeks. I left the stressful job. I'm actually really calm. But your body lived in that. It's like someone, I know, someone who smoked for, for 50 years and then two years later, they become unwell from it. They're like, but I haven't smoked for two, I haven't smoked for two years. We'll but that da- that damage has been done in your body. And so I guess that's the whole, yeah, I went off on a tangent there, but that's, and I have actually a question that's not even related to that. <laughs> and the body keeps the score. And exactly. the thing is, especially with your menstrual cycle, what happened three months ago can show up in your current cycle. Yeah. So around the Christmas period where for a lot of people, that's really stressful. Mm. The end of February, March, so many people had horrific PMS. Their wow. cycles were late. Their, sorry, not their cycle. Their period was late. Yeah. And all these things were coming up. And it was interesting to ask all of them well, what was happening three months ago. Three and months it was ago, around wow, that yeah. time where, yeah, everyone was just like head down. It's expensive. We're with weird family dynamics. We're traveling, yeah. all these different things. Yeah. Um, so, again, having that understanding, I think we normalize stress. And yeah. We're like, oh, but everyone stress exactly but everyone's unwell yeah (laughs) yeah (laughs) that was such a huge realization for me a few years ago it was like everybody around me is working the same hours everybody around me has some kind of physical illness every I do not know one business manager in Canberra in the role that I was in who retired healthy and that's and how much stress has to do with all of that but you do you, you normalize it because it's even, I've spoken about this so many times, but just even around that language of, oh, how are you? I'm busy. Or was, yeah. And that's stress language. That is stress language. And we've just been conditioned to just take that and accept that as normal. But well, we like also, said, yeah. I think we're also conditioned that it's successful. And yes, it's normal and successful yeah. and the marker of our 
Oh, what I was going to say. I forget what I was going to say. No, it's gone. (laughs) Yeah, but I think I've seen so many things on social media that are like, have you ever seen, have you ever witnessed a a rest, a well-rested woman? And what does that Mm. look like? And I know Mm. one of my biggest challenges in wanting to, I want to do all the things. As I said, I'm curious about everything. So I want to hang out with all the friends. I want to give my partner the time. I want to go and explore new things and go to salsa and pottery classes and run a business and continue learning. And one of my biggest, I think, life challenges is slowing down and Mm -hmm. prioritizing rest. And my mom was a single mom. So of course she never rested. She was always working I think I've literally seen that woman sit down and read a book like twice in my life. Mm -hmm. But rest to me was always associated with being, and and this is a belief that I have created. My mom never said this to me, but Mm -hmm. I've associated with being lazy or not going to get anywhere or never going to be successful if I sit and rest for an hour. And it's goddamn girl, like you need that rest to be productive. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. That's something I talk a lot about in the business space as well is the slowing down to speed up. And that's one of the pillars that we have in the mastermind is like really making sure that you are nurturing your nervous system and working within your own energy type and within your cycle and within all of the ways that you are uniquely meant to be working rather than just having that mentality and breaking those beliefs and breaking that conditioning that in order to be successful or that your success is measured by your productivity, which is what I was going to say when I forgot my words before, yeah. something along those lines. I like that, yeah, your success is connected to how much you do and how much you are doing. But really, I so truly believe, and this is success in business, but also success just in life and health and everything. I truly believe that your success is so much more connected to your being rather than your doing yeah. And when you can connect to that and you can work through your own stuff, you'll have your own stories. I had my own stories. I remember sitting, I before my business was making any money and before I had lots of clients, which by the way, slight language shift, I'm not busy. I'm as full as I want to be. Yeah. Like I'm at the capacity that I have actually chosen, which feels so good for me, but not busy. Because now even if someone says, how's work? And you just want to be like, oh yeah, it's busy because you've got lots going on. But it's not, it's, it's, I have associated busy with stressful. So it's as full as I want it to be. That's what it is. I like the, I like the word full. I try and use it. Someone's like, how was your day? And I'm like, it was full. Yeah. (laughs) It's as full as I chose. That's, I'm at my chosen capacity, which is really amazing. I forgot where I was going with that now. (laughs) I was going to add, I was going to add. Go back to bed. (laughs) Where this is where cyclical living is actually really profound and has helped me Mm -hmm. a lot because understanding my body's energetic capacity and when I need rest and when I can go and put my foot to the pedal to the metal yeah. has given me this, I guess, monthly framework for knowing when when I have my bleed or when I'm coming up to my period, again, that autumn wintery phase, I know that I'm not going to be at my best capacity. So mm. I really try to avoid doing podcasts like this or workshops or big important meetings because I know that my energy is not going to be able to meet those demands. I just yeah. don't have capacity. And I know that not everyone's world and life can be structured in such a way. I was going to ask, you- what advice do you give to people who are sitting there going, well, that's all well and good for you guys. You have your own business. Yeah. For those who who are still in a traditional maybe setting where that output is measured daily and it's expected to remain the same despite what kind of mood, despite how high your stress levels are, despite what phase of your cycle you are in. How do you recommend to those people or even, so I I do my best in my business. I launch when I'm ovulating. Like I, I will purposely, again, like you said, I will try not to book podcasts and things when I'm menstruating or particularly for me, those couple of days after I just am really just drained like I've been with my own energy but then my kids don't switch off so we've yeah. got you're a mom and you're like how can I be like no I'm just actually really turning inward this week so I'm not going to take you to your 10 after we school curricular park, activities sorry. we can't change our life yeah with everything so what advice would you give to someone who would like to start cyclical living but feel like there's a lot of 
their external situation right now that is maybe not within their control to say slow down in that autumn winter phase to the capacity that their body maybe needs what would you say to them yeah and and a lot of people are in that situation Mm. a lot of people don't have autonomy over what their day looks like if you have children that's exactly it you can't be like we'll just sit and be quiet for the next week (laughs) I'm bleeding for five days you need to leave me alone yeah I I like to to school I'm staying in bed (laughs) totally I like to think of everything in terms of like load so Mm -hmm. not every day will be perfect but what is the load of that day overall so if you have a nine to five where you have to show up the same way every single day what can the what can you then do before work or after work that's going to reduce the load on your stress levels so if you have a busy day come and you're almost on your way to bleeding or you are bleeding instead of organizing a dinner with a friend that night or going to like some big event have a bath schedule yeah. space for a bath if you have a partner, you can ask your partner to cook for you that night or mm. to give you a massage or just something that's going to reduce yeah. that load. Right. Or you sit and you watch TV on the couch I instead of that. going and socializing with your friends. Yeah, It's the same as if you have, and I don't have kids, so I speak from just what I've witnessed and spoken mm. to clients about, is if your kids are at school and you are at home, or is there any part in your day instead of making a phone call to someone or instead of going to the post office can you just take 10 minutes and just sit and have a tea yeah. Yeah. so that it's reducing that overall load on your nervous system what I say to a lot of my clients and I try and do this as well is in my higher energy season so you know after my period and up until ovulation mm. I will actually try and cook extra so that when I do, when I'm coming up to my bleed, I might just make a random big batch of bolognese. Yeah. So I know day one or two of my period when I'm just like, I can't, I just yeah. put that, I just defrost that. And then yeah. I know I've got dinner there. Love that. How can you support future you knowing yeah, that yeah. it is going to keep coming in cycles? Yeah. And it's a great way for you if you have a regular cycle and of course there's strategies if you don't have a regular cycle that you can use as well Mm -hmm. but it's like you have this monthly framework which actually takes a lot of pressure off me and the women that I work with because you're not expected to show up the same way every single day I almost get excited for my bleed to come because I'm like you know what it's two days where I'm not making it well it's a few days where I'm not making any extra plans Mm. I'm not holding myself accountable to anything except for the bare necessities that I need to show up for Mm. and then you just take you have compassion for yourself and you take a little bit of that what's the word like urgency away from yourself yeah wouldn't it be amazing if you could go into a traditional job and they're like Wendy menstruate (laughs) you're like okay I I generally bleed from here to here I am advocating for it I um it's so amazing okay we will be more lenient with your output and you don't have to maybe meet xyz kpis this week or I wonder if I can probably if I ask that on my next because I'm hiring a PA shortly I wonder if she'd mind if I'm like (laughs) what do you bleed oh no I won't do that but but wouldn't that help me as an employer as well because I plan on working quite closely face-to-face with this person. So wouldn't that actually really help me as an employer to know and to understand and to meet that person where they're at and to make sure that not only they're working within their zone of genius, but just in the exact same way that I teach my business mentees to work within their own energy. Mm. So is she like, it's totally. almost, I feel like it should even be a responsibility of someone. To yeah. Know. And mm. and I really hope that eventually the workplace does move that way, especially in the corporate Mm. space. I know that's huge because it is run by a lot of men, but Mm. I, alongside my clinical practice, I work with a women's health product called the seed cycle, which is Mm. a concept of seed cycling, which provides you with- And it's amazing. I have an affiliate link if you want to check it out. I I love seed cycling. Yeah. Add that in the show notes because it's such an incredible way to start your cycle syncing journey as well. But her and I, we, I guess, are like the duo faces when we're doing Mm. workshops and masterclasses and trainings and things like that. And I know that we will often check in and be like, where are you at in your cycle? And if one of us is edging more towards our bleed or if one of us is edging more towards ovulation, we'll just be like, all right, I'll take this. I've got this a little bit more so you can like settle and sit back a little bit more. Or on days where she messages me, I'm like, look, I've got my bleed today. I'll do it. 
at a different time of the week when I've got more capacity and it's just she gets it she gets it yeah. yeah oh I love that that is just such a beautiful way to work it really truly is mm-hmm. you have an ebook that has some recipes for the different phases that would be a really great place for people to start wouldn't it how much is yeah. that ebook where can people get it from it's- $33, which is nothing. There are 24 different recipes, mm. breakfast, lunch, and dinner for each of the phases. Yeah. There's an explanation of what the phases are. There's like a whole table of what the sort of food you could be leaning more towards are in each yeah. different phase and why. Yeah. So it's a really great framework. I know one of my girlfriends literally just lives and breathes that book she's I don't really think I eat anything else except (laughs) you've got in this book all month long Um, oh I love that I have a copy of it and I haven't started using it yet but I very much look forward to that's my next step in my in, in in my cyclic living journey because it doesn't have to be that you just go all in straight away, like everything. It's what can you, maybe your first step is actually just tracking your cycle and yeah. just seeing what is happening symptomatically for your body, in your energy, in your mood. What days are your heavier bleed? Like what, all of these things, yeah. because even just that information is going to give someone like Serena so much information to work with when you start looking at maybe balancing hormones if, if you are not, functioning optimally in that area but then also when you look at what you are eating I think we forget that food is supposed to be medicine like we completely forget I've had another reminder of that recently at the end of last year I worked with a naturopath who we did like a gut microbiome test to see what was making me feel so sick and keeping me so bloated and then based on what was actually going on inside of my body she was like this is your eating plan and she's handed that to me based on, again, what's happening directly inside my gut. And my body is just thrived off that. Like it's lost nearly seven kilos of just excess, but it wasn't about the weight loss. I don't want to vomit every time I eat anymore. I genuinely know that my body is healing and there's more energy and everything. My skin is clear, like all these things. And that came after a few months of specifically working on my hormones. And I started seed cycling and I did a Dutch test to see exactly what was happening with my cortisol, with my estrogen. And she was able to identify that my liver wasn't metabolizing the estrogen properly. And again, you adjust your food, you adjust your natural supplements and things so that you can actually work with your body. But tracking, like tracking my cycle was like way back. That was the very first step to this instead of just being like, oh, I always have this headache at this time or I feel like my mood is uncontrollable at this time and there's something wrong with me. Maybe I should go back to the doctor and talk about antidepressants again. Yeah. Maybe you should, maybe a part of that is actually looking at the things that you're eating and how that you can support your hormones with that food and so that's what that book can do for you but that's also what working with Serena directly can do too what kind of symptom changes do you see with people when they start cyclically eating to support their hormones like I know what I've experienced within my own body between the the food changes between the seed cycling but what kind of changes do you see with your clients in PMS symptoms, so, mood. So, so many. So one of the biggest, I think, is um, seeing changes in their period pain and the heaviness mm. of their bleed. That yeah. is such a common complaint with so many clients. Not even complaint, but like a sign and a symptom that your body needs more support. Yeah. I had a client who had PCOS and she'd been trying to get pregnant for, I think it was 10 or 11 months mm. and within three months of implementing cycle syncing, which was just eating in a way we did do some um, supplementation as well, but eating in a mm. way that was really supporting her body. She got pregnant, yeah. which was the best message ever to receive. Yeah, I'll bet. I had another client. She didn't actually have a cycle for nine months. This mm. was combined EFT and cyclical living as well. So making sure her body was getting enough food to feel safe yeah. and making sure that she her nervous system felt safe on the mm. EFT emotional levels. So she got her period back after nine months. Which wow. was 
That is incredible. Um, women who have endometriosis, a reduction in their endometri- endometriosis pain, mm. which can sometimes be around ovulation or during mm. their bleed. And if you know anyone who's experienced endometriosis pain, it is horrific and mm. debilitating. So I'm very lucky to have not experienced it, but I had I have some friends who have, but I recorded a podcast last year with Emma Williams, the founder of Max Marketing and Socially M. And she was sharing her endometriosis story. And it was just so moving. And the surgeries yeah. after surgeries that she's had and all the the hospital trips and the debilitating pain. And mm. yeah, I can't I personally can't begin to imagine having yeah. to experience that all the it's, time. It's, it's a lot. And Unfortunately, I think the stats right now, one in 10, if not more women are, mm. are, have endometriosis or have PCOS. So yeah. it's this, there's a lot of things from the chemicals that are on everything to mm. the way that we're living, but there's a lot of evidence supporting that women are just not living in a way that is nurturing us. I think yeah. we have all these really powerful boss women who are like, And this might sound controversial, but who want to be like, I want to be a CEO and I want to do all these big things. And it's, you can, you absolutely can, but Mm. the way that you do it, I believe needs to be different to the way that a man does it. I agree. Because if they're showing up the same way day in, day out, then they can just go every day the same way. Mm. Whereas for a woman, if you're entering, you're about to bleed, but you're trying to push and go, not only is it going to take more of your energy, but it's going to be harder. Yeah. Whereas when you know that when you're in that that phase after you bleed, that kind of follicular springtime coming into ovulation, that you're going to be on point. You can write all these ideas down, have these yeah. meetings, and you're going to have the capacity to show up and, yeah. and do it. Yeah. So I just think that this is such a game changer for women across their entire reproductive years. And if we can yeah. teach this to girls in high school. Oh gosh, then, wouldn't that just change? Yeah. And they will enter the workforce with so much compassion for themselves and mm. be more productive, have more compassion for themselves, not have to deal with as many period problems and yeah. all the issues that come with all of that. It and just- so much shame and stigma around it too. There's I feel like even just from what I understand with girls coming through high school and that kind of education that is given, it is not an open conversation like this to be Absolutely. like, your energy will change. You should actually be feeling like this at this stage. This These changes may happen in your mood, but you can also help it with X, mm. Y, Z. Like mm. it's, they're offered contraceptives to manage the period pain, which my very unprofessional opinion because I'm not an expert in that industry I think that has a lot to maybe do with a lot of the things that we are seeing in these generations now that are experiencing that's my little theory again it, definitely it is not medical theory. advice it's not medical theory. I need to stop speaking <laughs> Yeah, I've been off the pill for many years, but I was actually forced off it because I had a blood clot and so therefore it was like you're never allowed back on the pill again and at first because I had been on the pill since I was but I had also had such regular period irregular periods Mm -hmm. I was always in so much pain and I was so disconnected from my body like I was just and so really coming off that is a was a blessing for me It really, truly was because now it's okay. I know I've been able to regulate my cycle. And like I said, I started tracking, it worked with things. I've obviously it went out of whack because I had babies and breastfed and all of those types of things. But now that it is back, I am more regular than I've ever been. I have less symptoms than I have ever had. And like you said, I look forward to those couple of days where it's like, yep, today I get to just, maybe I'm going to work from my laptop in bed. I'm going to like turn in wood and I'm going to be really compassionate with myself but people aren't teaching that yeah, yeah absolutely. and then and you feel shame it's oh you don't want to talk about it or it's icky or that's how I grew up yeah I, I grew up the same I remember when I remember when I was diagnosed with PCOS when I had the termination I didn't want to tell anyone I had so much shame mm. and then when I had PCOS I was like, you know what? I'm going to start, I'm going to talk to people. I'm going to ask them about their period. I'm going to talk to my friends about it. Yeah. And then that's what spurred on my curiosity because so many of my yeah. girlfriends were like, oh yeah, I don't really have a regular period or I experience mm. a lot of pain or yeah. I have really heavy bleeding or I have 
horrific acne or all these yeah. things that we just take as normal we, oh, we're women we just have yeah. to endure it yeah. and it does really upset me I have so many women that sit in front of me and either their daughters or when they were younger they went to a GP and were just put on the pill and especially when you're a teenager and you're I think of it as like a highway when you first get your period this highway between your brain and your ovaries mm. is starting to build and that can take five or six years for it to build yeah. a really strong highway to have all the traffic and the cars moving well and coherently without crashing into each other. And so when you then put a 13, 14 year old on the pill, you just are completely stopping that process. Mm. So that when she then comes off it at maybe 29, 30 and wants to have a baby, that connection between her brain and ovaries was stunted when she was so young. Yeah. And then you see women going on fertility treatments and all of these things and, it's not to bad mouth the pill. I think that the fact no. that we have choice over our reproduction and the way that we can, I guess, take control of our reproduction is mm. absolutely incredible. And I know that yeah. there are plenty of women in this world who have fought for that power, yeah. but we still need to have an option and choice and being given informed consent. Um, I was going to say, I don't think it's fully informed. I think yeah. that's what's actually really missing as you're speaking there. It really is because I was thinking about women listening who maybe are on the pill and this is not by any kind of shame or anything like you do what is best for your body because you know your body best 100%. But maybe that decision might not have been the same had you been fully informed of what is possible yeah of yeah course. Of yeah course. so it's a huge topic and there's so many parts to it but I think yeah. coming at your coming at your body and your health from a place mm. of curiosity yeah. and wanting to understand what is actually happening for you yeah. instead of band-aids such as medications and hormonal birth control and all of these things mm. it does take more time and energy but the longevity and the impact that has on you and the people mm. around you and how empowered you feel by knowing what's happening in your body it's like when yeah. you get an iphone you want to know how to work all the bits right you don't just use it to call you use it for messaging instagram emails yeah. all those things yeah. i feel like having not understanding your body as a whole is like having an iphone and just using it to call people <laughs> oh, and this is something I so wish that I explored for myself in my 20s, but the information just wasn't there. It just wasn't in yeah. front of me. And now I feel like I'm just connecting back, as I said, into my body, making peace with all of that, learning to even appreciate that yeah. time of my, there was a book that I read that really helped. It was a little more focused on business, like running business as well, but it was all around cyclical living. And it was, I think it's called Do Less by Kate Northrup. And it was really amazing, really eye-opening for me just in that cyclical living on different things I could be doing within my cycle to better support the way that I was showing up to my life. Mm -hmm. And I just think, gosh, like I've created all of this, what, maybe a few years before I have to start marrying a perimenopause. <laughs> like I wish that I had connected in to all of this so much earlier, but I am where I am and I do accept that. But yeah, I just was thinking, imagine having this information in your teens, in your 20s, yeah. um, and having that opportunity to spend those years then living yeah. in, in that beautiful connection and cycle with your body. And do you, I know you've got kids. Do you have a daughter? I've got two. Two daughters. Yeah. yeah. How, how amazing and incredible for them that you can teach them and share that wisdom with them yes. as they're growing up as well. I know. Because a lot of girls I'm going to go to school and be like, my bleed today, teacher. <laughs> Yeah, the oh, and this is oh. Simon in next. Month. It's too. Early. Yeah, it's too early. yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh gosh, but no, you're dead right. Between that and the emotional regulation tools, and so many gifts that we can offer young girls, and if you are a mother of boys, so many gifts that you can offer young boys as well, and just even being able to understand, like the amount of boys that I grew up with who were like, oh, or they purely just saw you having a period as another time that they're going to get yelled at <laughs> or a time that they can't have sex with you that's all yeah. it is to them as oh it's that no stay away she's got pms or oh, whatever yeah. and that's so even for boys growing up and understanding that women like you said at the very beginning like that was just the most beautiful simple explanation as men work on that 24-hour testosterone cycle yeah. whereas a woman works on a 28-day approximately 
hormonal cycle and just understanding that and how they can support a woman during that time. Yeah, I've been teaching my boyfriend about, and he is very curious as well. I've definitely dated people who are like, I don't care about this topic, but I'm like, you're going to have to care about it. (laughs) But he is so invested in it and he has labeled me as different animals in each season. (laughs) And he knows that. Um, Can you tell me the animals? Can you share? Can you share the animals? He refers to me as a deer in my follicular phase. So this is between my period, when my period finishes up until ovulation. He just says I'm like running around and prancing like this deer who has all this energy and is just, yeah, let's do everything. When I'm ovulating, he calls me a lioness, Mm -hmm. where you're a lot more like fierce, but super feminine and like really out there. And you just want to like really utilize all that power that you've got yeah he calls me a Tasmanian devil more towards the end of my luteal phase or towards my bleed so sometimes Tasmanian devils can be chill sometimes I'm a little bit more the other day I've definitely had ramped up PMS for my last cycle and he was mm. sitting and he was eating beside me and I just looked at him and I said you need to go sit on the other side of the room like I cannot stand you chewing beside me right now <laughs> You have no idea how much I relate to that. That's something that came into my awareness when I was pregnant with my first. And so for the last eight years, yeah, probably more so around my cycle, but gosh, it feels like at any time now. And it was so funny because when I was just on my, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but when I was on Mastermind Retreat last week, they, there was this game where you had to pull a card and answer a question about yourself. And my question was like, name three things that people do at home that irritate you. And I was like, they chew near me. Huh? They breathe too loud. Uh-huh. Yep. I hear you. I hear you. So I hear that. And it's amazing. Like you hear that sound and you just go into this like rage, like do not, yeah. do not chew near me. And the other thing that, that really irritates is a dog licking itself. And that sound oh, yes. sounds oh, to me like Lord. the chewing. So Uh I put the two together. I'm like, you chew. Oh, God. I am a lovely person, I swear. But you chew like a dog licking itself and you need to get away from it. I totally get it. (laughs) I totally resonate. My sister was the worst growing up with her and her chewing near me. (laughs) My mom mom used to joke and say, I can't eat near you because I hold my breath and I can't chew. Yeah, I've had to do a lot of tapping on it. I do mainly so for my kids because they can't always like it. Can your mouth closed? But it's not even the mouth closed. It's just the sound. And I've done a lot of tapping just on that irritation. But sorry, what was the fourth animal? Oh, yeah, the fourth animal when I do bleed and have my period is a koala. Oh. (laughs) It's great because he knows that in my, like when I'm in between finishing my period and ovulating, he can be more playful and jokey and maybe push my buttons a little bit more and he knows that in the lead up to my period not to do that and to be more like soft and nurturing and I know that each month like this is amazing and we haven't been together for very long but each month when I do get my period he bought me roses once as a congratulations for bleeding (laughs) he got all my favorite loco love chocolates and just laid them on the bed knowing that I was coming over but it enhances your relationship because Mm. then they know how they can interact with you in a way that's not going to make you get pissed off or know when you might be feeling a little bit fun and flirty and not to book date night the day before you're about to bleed, but to walk around ovulation. And it just, it really enhances your relationship, which is beautiful. I love that. Now I, before we wrap up and for everyone who's listening, thank you. Cause I know we've chatted for a while, but this conversation has just felt effortless and I absolutely love that. Serena is a master manifester. And I shared a couple of episodes back, my stories around manifestation, some amazing things like the house that I live in, even the job that I'm in at the moment, like all these things that I know I've brought into creation because I have intentionally manifested it. Mm -hmm. And Serena is also a master manifester and has so many stories. Could you share one? Could you pick one and share with us something that you have manifested into your world? There are, yes, there are so many stories. I'm going to share the same one that I shared last time because it just feels like the most rogue and random (laughs) manifesting story that I've had. And again, I've manifested money. I've manifested my partner. Mm. I've manifested jobs, our house, all these things. But this one is my favorite. So my, I live with my best friend and we used to live in a, a different apartment. And when 
we went to re-sign our lease and then they told us that they no longer wanted us, they, they were going to sell the place so that our lease didn't exist anymore. Mm. And we both freaked out, but then we just trusted that we would find a place that it would be effortless and easy. And we both really wanted a place that had a marble bench top in the kitchen. And so we ended up finding a place quite easily, which was so incredible and the place that we got was an older apartment, but the owner said that he was going to renovate it. He was going to redo the walls, redo the floors, but the kitchen was still quite old and had like wooden bench tops, whatever. Mm-hmm. So we just thought you're going to renovate most of it. That's amazing. Let's move in. So we moved in and within a month of moving in, he had messaged us and said, do you mind if I renovate the kitchen? And we just, we both of us were just like, oh my God, of course not. Of course you can you can renovate the kitchen. Mm-hmm. We didn't ask him any questions about it. We didn't want to see the design or anything. We just fully trusted him. And when they were doing the kitchen, there was a block of what the bench top would be that was mm-hmm. sitting on the ledge. And within this manifestation meditation that we do, it's a Joe Dispenza one and he gets you to really feel into the thing that you want as if it's already happened mm-hmm. and he talks about accessing the quantum field, which Mm -hmm. is what happens when you're manifesting. And so when we then saw this little square of what our bench top would be, it was stone bench top and Mm -hmm. it was called quantum quartz. Wow. (laughs) We were just like, I remember both of us were just in absolute disbelief of how is this possible? And it just goes to show that when you manifest things and you let go of the attachment to the thing happening, it honestly shows up in the most weird and wonderful ways. And that's a testament to so many things that I've manifested. It's just happened. And I've I've been so caught off guard because I'm like, whoa, I didn't expect it to happen that way, but it's happened. Yeah, Yeah, Um, absolutely. Oh, I love that. (laughs) Oh, thank you for sharing that and for all of everything that you've shared today. I'm going to link again in the show notes. We'll link to where people can find you, link to your ebook, we'll link to the seed cycling, link to all the things that we've chatted about. But as we said at the beginning, just go and say hi on Instagram. So tell us, just even in case someone's like walking around, they're listening, tell us where we can find you and how we can work with you too. What capacity do you work in at the moment? Yeah. So you're mainly, I'm, pretty much on Instagram every day as a lot of people are. So you can find me at Serena Coventry underscore Mm -hmm. Serena is S A R I N A. A lot of people put E's in there. Mm -hmm. So Serena Coventry underscore always feel free to reach out in the DMS, ask me any questions on my website has all of my offerings. So I work one-on-one with women. I have a clinic space in the Northern beaches. If you're in the Mm. Northern beaches, otherwise I work online as well, which is great because I get to work with people all around the world. Yeah, And you can jump onto my website, www.serenacoventry.com. I also have packages there that have, we can do EFT and nutrition together. We can just do EFT. We can just Mm. do nutrition. I have a whole cyclical living module. So there's lots of goodies on there. And I'd also love to gift anyone who's listening and has come from this podcast 20% off any initial consult, whether that is nutrition or EFT. You can just write into your booking form that you listen to this podcast and we can go from there. Amazing. So tell her you you listen to Alive and Thriving. Yeah. Oh, amazing. Thank you. That's so generous. Thank you. No worries. And thanks for having me. You just honestly create what you have created and continue to create is just such an amazing space for women to come to and receive so many different modalities of advice and support from business to what we've talked about today, which is cyclical Um, living. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, what a beautiful conversation. All right. Thank you everybody for joining us. I, it has been an absolute honor to be in your ears again, and I look forward to sharing another journey with you next week. Thank you, Serena. Bye. Wow, what a journey it's been today. We are so grateful for each and every one of you who tuned in to Alive and Thriving. If you enjoyed this episode and want to help us keep growing, please consider subscribing and leaving a review on your favourite platform. It's a simple but powerful way to support a small business like ours to continue to make an impact.